we are cognizant in a way that we have not been before that the health of our planet is reliant on us preserving as much as possible that we can of the now remaining wild spaces, you know, even those spaces that have been impacted somewhat, but are still not yet built on by houses and buildings and and agriculture, which is a kind of of building, if you will, Um, that these, the, the preservation and conservation and restoration of these habitat spaces will be, they are the answer to holding uh, climate change where it is or reversing it. They are the answer to holding biodiversity loss to where it is or improving that. And so every, every little space that we can dedicate to being part of that. As the host of Cultivating Place, which is an award-winning podcast and NPR radio show, my guest Jennifer Jewell loves to garden and loves to advocate for gardening. Growing plants of all kinds is her expertise. Jennifer's knowledge, wisdom, and passion, however, extend well beyond sharing tips on when to sow seeds and how to deal with invasive species. Jennifer's passion is showing the existential connection between life on the planet and growing plants. In her riveting and awareness-raising book titled What We Sow on the Personal, Ecological, and Cultural Significance of Seeds, Jennifer helps readers understand the quantum and the spiritual and the activist perspectives to growing plants and protecting seeds. She believes that knowing and caring for seeds, the basis of all life on our planet, is one of the most proactive steps we can take to rebuild our human food systems, our social systems, and the global ecosystems of biodiversity on which we all depend. Jennifer's voice is not only powerful, but it's soothing, making our conversation an enlightening experience that I wished would never end. Fortunately, we can all continue to learn from her wisdom weekly on her radio show and her podcast. If you found this episode as engaging as I did, please comment, like it, and share it with your own community. Now, here is my conversation with the brilliant and inspiring Jennifer Jewell. Hello, Jennifer. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm really excited to meet you and speak with you. Um, as I mentioned just before we came on the air, uh, your book that we're going to talk about, I've been riveted to it, and uh, I think it's a book that's for everyone in the world, even though you can never have a book like that. But this one feels relevant to all of us. So. We'll we'll talk about it in detail, but I'm so so I'm excited to meet the author behind that and um and and let people get to know you and 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 what you're what you're here to talk about. Um, so you are a gardener, a gardening educator, um, and an, an advocate for gardening. I guess for more people gardening and for maybe gardening better. Um, but you also are um advocating for protecting seeds, and that was the the topic that really got my attention and why I wanted to talk to you because it is a very important subject that needs to have more light shined on it. So um, I'll also say that you are the um, a host of the national award winning uh, radio program and podcast on NPR, which I wasn't aware of before. So I have started listening to that too, um, called Cultivating Place. Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden. Um, it's very compelling, even if you're not a gardener. I am not a gardener, um, but it's also very soothing. And I think we need a little bit of that on the yeah. on the airwaves. So, we do. So welcome. And, you know, I, I'm so honored to have you here. How, how long have you been hosting that show? Uh, I started hosting a public radio program here in the North State of California, northern sort of interior northern California mm. in 2007 and that grew up into cultivating place as a national program in 2016. Um oh. and so we're 
going on about 400 episodes now. And um, as you mentioned, it is it is not a how-to garden. Uh, it is very much a, well, it's a little bit of how-to, but mostly that comes through my guests. Uh, mm -hmm. The hope is that it's more about why we garden than about how we garden uh. and more about why our gardens are important to us and to us collectively, whether that's environmentally, socially, economically, communally, um, than it is about why they're pretty places uh, mm -hmm. of, you know, of maybe individual importance or aesthetics. Uh, because, of course, we love our gardens for those things. But mm -hmm. uh, in in the work that I do, I'm really looking for uh, what that means at a kind of meta or quantum level, because I think I think that people who are called to gardening, whether as children or later in life, mm. it, if we kind of interrogate ourselves about what we what we receive from this task, uh, an act of creativity and productivity, uh, we will we will necessarily do it better if we know why we're doing it for ourselves and how it impacts our world. Um, and I have seen that definitely borne out through mm -hmm. uh, listenership and community groups that I speak with, Deborah, and how hungry they are to think about this activity as as much a spiritual activity or an activist agency kind of mm -hmm. uh, involvement and relationship rather than a commodity or mm. a status symbol or just like a thing. Um, this is very much a lifelong relationship for most, mm. for, for many, many people, um, even if it comes and goes in focus. Mm -hmm. uh, as as we go through the different chapters of our lives and yeah. and you know just like you were saying that we need a little soothing i i think we do we need mm. soothing but we also need reminding that even in our pot of flowers out front um we have agency and and we can choose and it it mm. really resonated with me to be invited to your program um and mm. its title how we can change the world this i believe is is one of the ways that a large cohort of people choose uh to spend their time and it is how we can change the world yeah um that i relate very much to what you said because um i think i might have mentioned before we went on that i or maybe i didn't that i am I hate to say it, but I will call myself a failed gardener. I, we did try. I remember my first daughter was born, and um, we really tried in, in Colorado, and we had very clay soil. We brought in a whole truckload yeah. and replaced it all, and it came in. Our carrots were this long, and we tried for a couple of years, and, and we laugh about how much money we spent on that relative to the nothing. <laughs> What we did get was very appreciative, but I think you just mentioned something so significant that probably was missing, and that was the why. I thought, well, we have a baby. We should have a garden. That's just what people do. You start teaching, but but we didn't embrace it in the way that one – it's not – a in Colorado, especially or in a lot of places in the world, it's not the most natural thing if you've never done it, mm. and it's not – you have to – approach it. I love that that you give it a, a spiritual dimension because now I know that I would I would approach it in a much deeper sense and the why would be there. Um somehow my daughter became one of the world's best gardeners, so who knows? Yay, good, good for <laughs> her. Grew that one well, but <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um so but yeah, your reason I I love how you define it and describe it and, and I love that that's what you talk about on the show as well. Because that will encourage more people who maybe don't feel like natural gardeners to tune in to both your book and your and your show. Because it's a picture it's a much bigger it's a bigger conversation. Picture. Yeah. 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 So that has been a, a long time that you've been doing it. Um, why, did, why did you find it important? And we're going to talk about your, th this new book. You've written three books now. Um, I've only been introduced to one, but I am definitely going to go back and, and pick up on the first two. Um, again, not being a gardener, but, but 
this new book um i'm trying to i'm trying to find the name why don't you say i i only know the what we sew but i don't have the there we go there we go thank you because i have the pdf yeah (laughs) unfortunately it's uh, it's what we sew on the personal ecological and cultural significance of seeds yeah and uh why why did you choose this book just as sort of an overview or introduction on this topic well so the the it's a little bit longer of a story and I'm going to backtrack a little bit in that when I launched cultivating place, the, the program and podcast, um, my mission was engaging and empowering and encouraging gardeners to Mm -hmm. think of themselves in these bigger ways and to think of their gardens and their gardening communities in these larger ways. And, uh, that really landed very receptively with an audience. The podcast is, mm. is downloaded well over a million times and the a year. And then that Congratulations. first year. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. That's a big number. And, and that makes me happy to hear too. That that's yeah. that much interest. Yeah. Well, and I think, again, it that says very little about who I am and mm. <laughs> says a lot about how interested people are, how hungry they are to um, kind of reclaim what is a an activity and a relationship uh, that humans have been engaged in across time and space, across all cultures, uh, on in every civilization on this planet, uh, you know, dating back to the earliest records of human remains with any artifacts on them, there will be people carrying seeds in their little oh. leather pouches. Um, so it didn't just start with the cultivation period that we kind of think no, of. No, our relationship to plants is, you know, has been as ancient as we are because hmm. that is a survival relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but very shortly, you know, after humans began, uh, and I digress a little bit, but I think it's interesting very shortly after we started forming communities and small towns or, or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, groups of humans that would, or would not become larger civilizations, we weren't just cultivating plants for food. We were cultivating them for ritual for mm-hmm. medicine, for utility, and mm-hmm. for beauty as well as food. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think for us to have constricted the idea of gardening down to a very sweet hobby activity that mm-hmm. middle class people do with extra time on a Saturday before a football game or something <laughs> is is inaccurate and it is a diminishment of this, uh, this impulse to garden as I, I refer to Mm -hmm. it, uh, well to a much smaller kind of, not only a smaller, uh, status and respect, but a smaller truth than it actually Mm -hmm. is. And so when I, when I began the program after writing about gardening for about 10 years and becoming frustrated with where mainstream garden media kind of how they represented gardening and gardeners Mm -hmm. and, and Mm -hmm. what that implicated for us as well, that we were this hobby destination objectified consumer activity. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I started cultivating place. And very shortly after that, I was asked to write my first book, which was, uh, became the earth in her hands. And that was a look at the horticultural world through the lens of women in leadership positions and Mm. how and why those women in these leadership positions from, you know, being the directors of large botanic gardens or garden writers or garden photographers or nursery women or plant explorers and breeders, Mm. how Mm. these women were actually changing for the better and more expansive, what our horticultural world looked like and included in this world. Mm. And from that book on, every book has been a sort of exploration of a different facet of our gardening and horticultural world uh, in a way that I hope it has helped me certainly, but I hope helps readers and listeners see 
our horticultural and garden world in these bigger, broader ways uh, that allow them to be more expansive with their gardens and their their gardening. And so the, the second book was about looking at about 40 different really really not only beautiful, but very ecologically functional uh, climate and regionally based gardens across the U.S. West. Mm. And in, in this book with the photographer, Caitlin Atkinson, I was very much, look, we were very much looking to kind of change the paradigm of what we consider to be beautiful and what is included in that. And then what that means in in the places where we garden, both environmentally and economically, uh, that we can have beautiful native plant habitat gardens that are uh, strongly designed and aesthetically pleasing uh, not just a weedy mess, but also incredible contributors to, you know, whether it's water quality or air quality or habitat for uh, migrating birds or pollinator support, to say nothing of native plant habitat restoration and mm-hmm. uh, reconnection. Uh, and so the third book really was instead of why did I write it, it was how did it come to me to be written? Because, uh, you know, in these other two lenses of, again, sort of exploring the different dimensions of what it means to be a gardener, to have a garden, to garden as a verb, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's sort of this, like, where does it start? Where does it end? What is, what is the essential element that keeps humans engaged in this activity. Uh, And and it was very much germinated from that early time in the pandemic, when those of us who were already gardening, uh, went to order seeds, and we kept getting um, email messages and alerts saying out of stock or back ordered or not available. And there was this real kind of like existential wow like how is that possible we could be out of seeds and and again for those who hadn't started gardening you know there was this wholesale um jump into the garden by yes. people who hadn't gardened before and and that was of interest to me because there is this correlation between like an em- economic downturn or uh, a large global uh, catastrophe, whether it's a war or a climate event or uh, an economic downturn, and people turn to gardening. Um, and that was psychologically interesting to me because, mm-hmm. as you noted right in the beginning, it makes no economic sense to try and garden uh, for your own food. Like it, it is so yeah. much more expensive for us to grow our carrots right. in the backyard than it is for us to buy right. them from a very good carrot grower. And so mm-hmm. that all kind of confluenced. And I thought, somehow this all comes back to seed. How does this come back I to see. seed? And why should we be paying more attention? And why should we care about that? Uh, both philosophically, but also very pragmatically, mm-hmm. Deborah. You know, um, I, that I was really drawn in quickly to your book because you start you speak in the preface, I believe, about how you were on a book tour, and uh, you know, as I think California, you you live in California, and you were traveling to New York, and Californians were the first state to say, everybody, okay, go home, we're closing down, and. I really resonated with this feeling that you had that you you didn't think, well, you didn't think, uh, are we going to get sick or you weren't afraid of how we're going to get home and all that. You just thought, what about the seeds? How are we going to get the seeds? And how that almost, I don't, you didn't use the word panic attack, but it kind of felt like you had this, did you have like when you went on and saw a sold out, sold out, sold out, that there was this like, feeling that you might not survive and it wasn't a logical necessarily Mm -hmm. right it was gut level and and i have to tell you this whole subject to me is very primal it's Mm. very interesting how emotional i feel about this topic even though i'm not a gardener so when you said that i'm like oh my gosh he's right right we're 
you know, you couldn't get the seat. That is a scary feeling. Yeah. No, there was very much a, this, again, completely irrational, but also like uncontrollable completely. existential yeah crisis in my, you know, lizard brain of, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, if we can't get seed, we really won't persist, yeah. Yeah. you know, like, because when you think about it, when you look all around you, a lot of plastic, notwithstanding your trees, your flowers, <laughs> your food, some of the food you eat also eats seed plants. Um, mm. you know, so not only are yeah. we talking about wheat and corn and soy and rice, which are all seed staple crops, mm -hmm. but we are also talking about what feeds our meat, what, what, uh, you know, grows our wood, what grows mm. our bamboo and our cotton and like so mm. much of what we have surrounded ourselves with as humans, including our newly intensified understanding of the importance of the ecosystems around us and how we have degraded them, we have disturbed and divided them, they are completely reliant on the persistence of the seed shed to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, those migrating butterflies and birds and mammals are all reliant on the seed bearing plants who represent about 80% of the plant life that covers the planet. Those are all seed bearing plants. And so it is life. It is it, life. It is life, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and it was this real, like, as I started to do a little research, just my own due diligence as a gardener. And I, I kept, you know, the more I dove down into it, it is so deeply embedded in our language, the importance of seed and how kind of capacious it is as a symbol, as a mm. signifier, as a metaphor. You know, you think seed clouds and seed money and seed mm -hmm. pearls and uh, yeah. seeds of change, right? And and that I can go on and on with that. Yeah. But uh, it, to to recognize for myself, for maybe the first time, you know, and I'm somewhere in my mid fifties at that point, uh, late fifties now. And to recognize that if the first four elements are earth, air, fire, and water without the seed bearing plants and those seeds, earth, air, fire, and water are not life on earth for humans. Mm. Only with the introduction of the seeds does this become a habitable planet for us as humans. And that was a real like, whoa, yeah, moment for me. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's as though we know it in some way that we don't even know how we know it. Exactly. Not, not just going back. And that's why I get emotional, even though I have no, no planting of my own, you know, I buy everything somewhere else. So it is like a knowing and it's, and it's, it does speak to an existential fear, and, and we'll talk in a little bit more about why seeds are actually in trouble, because that's important. So it's almost more like the the the, the, the sadness from the past or something that that could be breaking, but also like the future and maybe this clarion call to all of us that yes. wake up, wake up. And so what I'm what I'm curious about before we do get into some of the you know things that are uh, challenging to the 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 propagation and the, the, the sanctity, I'll say, and um, integrity of seeds going forward is um, do, I'm curious if people, when the, when the fear of the pandemic, which was such an unknown, which is why it spoke to us maybe more than an earthquake or a war or something. Yeah. We hadn't had one since, uh, what is it, 1918 or something. Yeah. So to all of us, we didn't know where this was headed. Since that has basically resolved in whatever way that we could call that resolved. Right. Um, have people fallen off the gardening wagon just in general? Like those who picked you it know, up as a short term? I, am, I do not know the answer to that. I would guess that some have just mm. by necessity. So prior to the pandemic, I believe the last census indicated to us that there were about 
38% of all U.S. households were engaged in gardening. That was about oh, that many. 42 million households. But post-pandemic, now, and what that means, gardening, could, okay. could be a large range, right? Okay. It could be it a windowsill. It could be flowers on, okay, got yeah, it. it. It could be that. Okay. It could be the person, you know, it could be that you get your lawn mowed. I'm not sure what the exact criteria was. I see. But self-identified as engaging in gardening in some way. Uh, Post-pandemic, that number was 75% of all U.S. households, over 100 million households. And to me, that was this real revelation of this is a very important moment to wow. speak to those newcomers and to say, those of us who have already been at this if you are in it for the long run, we are here to help. We, mm. you know, don't give up after the first carrot failure. Try <laughs> and try again. And like, you know, this is one of the great lessons of the seeds, Deborah. Like, no plant puts out one seed. Mm -hmm. They put out millions of seeds over their lifetime. And they, I guess, hope, like anything, that a small proportion of those find ground, germinate, and grow mm -hmm. to maturity. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, nice. That's try, a nice thought. <laughs> try, try again is yeah. Uh, yeah. one lesson of the seeds. So, <laughs> well, and, and know why you're doing it, I think, because it will challenge you if you're not, if you're yeah. coming into it, um, yeah. which, which I would, um, you know, maybe we can back for just a few minutes and talk about how you, how you did come to it, because um, I could, I could let that topic go. But uh, I think it is so important to teach our children and to show our children how to garden or what it's about or to have a yard if possible or a windowsill where you grow something. And just because you are so such a uh, committed gardener and this is really your identity in so many ways, how did you come to it? You talk about a little bit how you, you know, you grew up in the same state as I am living in uh, Colorado, yeah. which is not a gardener's, you know, it's not Iowa. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, but what brought you to, to love it in the way that you do? Well, I think one, I was lucky enough to have a professional gardening mother who loved it. And I had a wildlife biologist father. So you can see the Lovely marriage of my parents. Yes. Uh, the, the marriage of my parents very much in the title of my program. And I didn't realize until I was a young adult that not everybody grew up sure. learning the names of plants and their faunal associates and, oh. you know, all of these things. But, and you're not wrong. Um, about the fact that, you know, when we think of gardening conventionally, and what I mean by that is, you know, kind of a standard border garden against your house mm -hmm. or uh, a standard vegetable garden in a raised bed or a little plot in the back garden. Um, Colorado is, it's got his very own specific, beautiful temperament and climate <laughs> and challenges. But all you have to do is look around you at the incredible diversity of plants who make their lives there to know that it is not unnatural to garden there. It's just not natural to garden there with the standards of care and aesthetics that are promulgated in our industry uh, and tell you that your garden is supposed to look like it comes out of Boston or England. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of one of my responses. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I am, I, I just I, and I think this is true of most children, if they're given any exposure at all, without a lot of um, over scheduling or over direction by adults mm -hmm. is that they naturally <laughs> like go out and play with sticks and leaves and seeds and berries and they will make a fort out of anything and they will make toys out of everything. Um, and it's us in our like restraining them to the indoors or the urban spaces. And so you don't have to be uh, you don't have to be engaged in planting carrots or roses in your back garden for me to consider you a gardener. If you are involved and attentive to even like, I'm looking at a tree outside my window right now, Deborah, and it's turning color. And I think mm. many people have this passing relationship with the plants mm. of their places. They mm. might not even know their names. They'll just be like, 
You know, that big tree on the corner that turns yellow in the fall and has those pretty little flowers. That's, you need to in know. This, that's like that yeah. right there is this yeah. energetic relationship that I'm yeah. a big believer in. And I think it comes to us instinctively. So, you know, my, my best recommendation to other people is just first start by like paying attention, looking at the plants around you. Yeah. Then you can figure out if, you know, they're brought in from somewhere else or yeah. if they're native and just watch what they do. And if you think they're beautiful, maybe ask somebody their name and maybe, you know, try and grow that plant in your yard yeah. uh, or, or just take your kids to the park and talk about the plants you see. Like you don't, I think just being aware is the best place to start and paying attention to what what moves you like what is pretty yeah. what like the sound of the leaves at this time of year of the aspen mm. in colorado or like the wind through a ponderosa pine at altitude in colorado there's nothing no, nothing agree. more beautiful than yeah. that well, and, and, and one can't appreciate all of that as I do without having uh, successfully grown carrots. But um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate what you just said, because I know my own starting out was my sister and I used to sift dirt in, with a sifter, a flower yeah. sifter for eight hours. I'm not kidding. Right. And we, it is one of our best memories of life. And so um even all these years later, we still think back to the beauty. It was like silk sand because we would sift it again and again and again till it was like, <laughs> That's you know, great. probably could have sold that to somebody for gardening. It probably right. would have been lovely. Yeah. Could have used it a few years later. Um, you mentioned, uh, and I want to touch on the native plants as long as you just brought that up. It's something that um, I have learned quite a bit about recently, uh, again, because my, my daughter has a large yard and she and her husband um, are very, uh, they're, they're a little bit in trouble in their neighborhood because they tend to want to create something that brings in all the butterflies. And, and they do have a very robust um, animal life, insect life, as a, whatever people want to call squirrels and everything in their yard because of this. And, um, but in the neighborhood, which is otherwise, other than them looks very well tended according to perhaps what I would consider out of date standards. Yes, I'm going to say well tended. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, they let it, they let it go. They don't like to mow the lawn for a long time. And which, which are all things that we have learned that we need to do to protect our environment. So. Yeah, I have, I guess, a couple of thoughts on that. And one is we see more people choosing these native plants. It is becoming, it has gotten our attention because of the biodiversity loss and because of the clim of climate change and yes. monocrops and everything that we're all slowly and some of us learning faster than others. What can we each do? And that has definitely raised the interest. Yeah. But it is still a struggle. You have to put oh. a sign on your yard to say, please don't mow, no mow may or something, you know, so that others will understand what, that you're not just being a bum, but this is intentional. Yeah. How do we, how do we, everyone's talking about it, but no one is doing <clears throat> Rarely. You are the oddball in the neighborhood, at least in, in. Yeah. I think this is true across the country. There are, as you say, little pockets that have gotten a better, better traction with this. But I think that, you know, we as people who are engaged in this and, and really compelled by this uh, need to just keep talking about how joyful it is, how rewarding it is, how beautiful it is. And I think we do have to be cognizant of things like um, making sure that the edges <clears throat> are clean enough that people can walk on our sidewalks, oh, sure. uh, not get jabbed by pokey plants <laughs> that, you know, in areas where you, <clears throat> hang on just a second, oh, sure. Take your are time. dealing with, uh, fire as an issue that mm -hmm. these, this is not just a lot of fuel buildup, uh, that mm -hmm. is going to be a fire hazard that you, um, 
a, a beautiful horticulturalist on the East Coast named Rebecca McMacken refers to this as cues to care that you mm. demonstrate in I love deadheading that. or cutting back mm-hmm. or putting a little tidy mulch around the edges mm-hmm. so that people can see that this is an intentionally and cared for. It is a well tended yes, space. Yes, it is. Yes. It is just differently tended than are are what we have over many generations come to see as a default landscape of mm. overmown, overgrown, overfed, overwatered, non-native monoculture turf grass. Like we have figured out how to tend to this crop better than any <laughs> other crop. No and, and when that is our default, we are we are lost as a species, right? Like <laughs> we don't we don't look like the places we live and we are wasting our resources as well as destroying uh habitat and environment. So I think that if we keep talking about the joy and the benefits. Um, one, you know, and we, we slowly change the understanding of what is beautiful. I had mm-hmm. an entomologist that I interviewed uh, at the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum's Nature Gardens. And he said to me, you know, you can show me any garden and it might have a lot of flowers and a beautiful design. But if I walk into that garden and I don't hear the sounds of mm. hummingbirds and bees and butterflies uh, working in the garden and living in that garden, then that garden isn't beautiful. That garden mm. is dead. Mm. And, you know, I, I love that just really like yes. landed in my heart yes. because yes. you, and as gardeners, we know it's true. Like when we are out working in our spaces and we might have a little bit of lawn, um, but we don't need to feed it you know, toxic Chemicals. fertilizers. We just don't right. need to. No. And we can let some of the flowering weeds populate it. And it's still going to be a beautiful, yeah. but much more diverse space. But, yeah. you know, to include all these other plants that invite in dynamic change with the seasons and yeah. all of these creatures, like that is just pure spirit to be standing Mm -hmm. watering my my native salvias here in california and have a hummingbird like right next to me is magic and and i think most people experience it that way yeah thank you for you you're so you're so adept at explaining things and and you do this in the book too you write so so beautifully about the way you describe the land and the seeds Mm -hmm. and the seasons and the um yeah, the, I, I love also when I'm kind of shifting, but that you, you start with October, like it, it's a, it, it's, it's like part journal and part uh, educational tomb and, uh, and, but the writing is just spectacular and it, oh. it really makes, and you bring in your own personal um evolution as well. So I, I think all of it, it, it's it's hard to explain from the outside what all this book is, but it, but it's very rich. And a lot of it is because you have such a propensity with words. You really choose the right ones to, to, to inv- invoke the the emotion that I think is there. I mean, gardens mm-hmm. are an emotional thing yes. as, as we're talking, as we've been talking about. Yes. Um, I, I let's move in a little bit to talking about the importance of seeds and, and what we're kind of facing um, in terms of the danger to our, to our future, really to our, right. to our self, to our, to our existence, not to our salvation, to yeah. our existence. Certainly, um, certainly to our, our quality of life. Right. And, and again, it is for me, this sort of nexus of climate change, biodiversity loss, the uh, urbanization of our planet, something like 80% of us will live in urban environments by 2030, I think is the current number. And we are cognizant in a way that we have not been before, that the health of our planet is reliant on us preserving as much as possible that we can of the now remaining wild spaces, you know, even those spaces that have been impacted somewhat, but are still not yet 
built on by houses and buildings and, and agriculture, which mm-hmm. is a kind of, of building, if you will, mm-hmm. yeah. um, that these, the, the preservation and conservation and restoration of these habitat spaces will be, they are the answer to holding uh, climate change where it is or reversing it. They are the answer to holding biodiversity loss to where it is or improving that. And so every every little space that we can dedicate to being yeah. part of that, you know, and as Dr. Doug Tallamy has made clear to us, you know, that, that non-native monoculture turf grass represents about 40 million acres in the U.S. Unbelievable. That's larger land area than all of our public, our national parks put together. So if we were to dedicate even half of that to native plants and ecosystem restoration, that right there is one antidote to climate change and biodiversity loss. But for that, we need seed. Like on our planet, the the seed bearing plants, right, are are a large group called spermatophytes. And the first were the gymnosperms. These are our conifers and the like. Mm. Uh, And the next big group were the angiosperms. These are our flowering plants. That includes like our roses, our carrots, our oak trees. Um, They represent about 80% of all plant life, as I mentioned before. And there are something like 300,000 of them, 300,000 species. Only 260,000 have been described. And so mm. the 40,000 that scientists guesstimate we have yet to describe and that we are losing before we even get to describe them, you know, they've been co-evolving on this planet for over 365 million years. Mm. They know something about survival and evolution and adaptation and resilience that we don't understand, but we would do well to try and listen and learn better. And, um, you know, I think that is where I see the importance of us as humans trying to understand seed better. The And when I say seed, right, it's, I'm using it as a word, but it is, of course, the, the smallest kind of essence and viable unit of, of growth for all these species of plants. Those include our food. They include our lumber and our fiber and Mm -hmm. our, um, you know, oils, and they include our medicines and Mm -hmm. they include our flowers and they include our wild plants. And I think one of the things that was important or, you know, like you mentioned this idea of me kind of being journal and kind of being research. Mm -hmm. And that was really important as a structure for all of these reasons, that it was so complex an understanding for me to try and work through that it took me that whole year of things happening in my ecosystem or in my life for me to even Mm. recognize what I still needed to study, you know, like, Mm. and the importance of trying to reintegrate our understanding of our food seed with our environmental seed that they aren't separate. Like we, we have siloed them. So we'll hear a lot about diminishing varieties of heirloom, you know, vegetables and fruits. Um, and we'll hear about environmental and ecosystem restoration in a whole different realm, but they're the same. All of our food plants are, are native plants from somewhere at some time that have been selected and chosen and bred and then Mm -hmm. perpetuated by the human hand. And so putting them back together to show that they are the same, the same problem, but also the same opportunity that seemed important to me. So, so, so important. And I think it's definitely not something that just comes to one naturally. I mean, you have to say that. And yeah, I wanted you to speak a little bit about you know the the corn and the soy and all these uh seeds that are that are currently now as you described um owned by uh the big four corporations yeah. who have and those just this GMO type seeds yeah. not all seeds but 
um, that in itself is is such a danger that there's four uh, pharmaceutical uh, petrochemical petrochemical companies companies. that control sixty percent of the seed in our world. Now, wow! So, I mean, it's it's just jaw dropping and terrifying at the same time. Yes, and and it does beg the question that in a country where we never let anybody get a hold of more than 40% of the market or, or less, that why have we allowed these to grow and grow and grow till they have 60%? That's, that's, that's the million dollar question. But, and if you know the answer to that, you well, can, I mean, you part, can say of the answer, <laughs> part of the answer is profit. And part of the answer is because we stop paying attention. We have so many other things to think about. That's what I wonder we, sometimes. We lose, we lose the capacity and, You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. part of the point of this book for me personally was that I didn't know these things, Deborah. Mm -hmm. So like when I started realizing that I wanted to study it and then I started realizing what I didn't know, it was a very clarifying uh, illumination, if you will, that none of us understand it because we've been so distanced from it. Of like, oh, don't you worry about it. I'll take care of the seed. Don't Mm -hmm. you worry about it. I'll take, you know, and so I assume that when I go buy my packets of seed, someone bigger than me is actually vetting that seed or paying attention. But that, as we know, just like how we spend our money and how we've spent our votes, that is an abdication of responsibility that especially doing what I do. I should have been better about. And so this know. this was a personal exploration mm-hmm. as much as anything for me to try and put my head around where is seed and how is it being cared for and who is stewarding it and and where is it endangered and and yeah. how if like how if anything can we can we affect change with that? And the answer lies in that question you asked me about how many gardeners we have because if we are that many, mm-hmm. you know, 75% of all U.S. households, if even a half of that cohort of households made the decision to not buy seed that was GMO and controlled and covered in insecticide and pesticides and herbicides by Bear Monsanto, like that would be a, a, a significant economic indicator to Bear Monsanto that this is not how we want our world grown. Mm. It's a radical vote. It's a radical act yes. to just do that. And, yes. and it's in our power. So it often is. people, they look at like this biodiversity and people are, right. you know, my own neighborhood, everything's getting torn down and being replaced and you have no power. And no matter what you do, you protest, it keeps happening. This is actually a very tangible step that people can take. Definitely. But, what, you know, is to, is to, gr- to grow more seeds, to create more seeds that are, that are not modified. But when you, I just want to clarify something. When you said 60%, which is the, is the number I've read as well, 60% of them are owned by four corporations that are petrochemical corporations, pharmaceutical, like why are they owning seeds? Like that's, that's the first yeah. question. Those are not, they're not farmers, right? Right. Um, I'm just wondering how, how do we know when we buy something, first of all, if it's GMO, and and do they own 60% of all all seeds or is it just the corn i mean of all gmo seeds and is it just those big right. crops so, that we talked about uh, monocrops 60% is definitely a number of the market share but that market share is dominated by uh the large commodity crops so uh, and I give a list somewhere in the book on this. And they aren't all GMO, but many of them are. And 45% of uh, GMO corn, I think, and soy, but maybe it's just corn, is those genetics are owned and patented by Bear Monsanto. By but one company. By one company. 45% by mm-hmm. one company. What is now um, one company? And yeah. according to the, the FDA, uh, there is no non-GMO, non-insecticide treated corn that is not listed as organic. So all non-organic corn Mm -hmm. grown in the U.S. at the commodity level is treated with chemicals, with these neonicotinoids that destroy 
our pollinators and our waters and our soil life. Um, and they are GMO. So like it, it is, it is now taken up a very robust number of acres being planted in these seeds. Yeah, and, and so, you know, what we do about it is every single thing we possibly can. Yeah. We, we talk to our council people. We don't buy them ourselves. We try not to buy the products that are being, uh, you know, perpetuated by these same companies in order to keep these seeds going. We ask our local farmers and our nurseries also not to buy them, not to sow them, not to sell them to us. We, uh, we vote on these kinds of bond or big ag issues in our counties, in our mm -hmm. states, and at the federal level. Um, and we try hard to grow, uh, to, to speak to our local nurseries, speak to our local seed sellers, even the sales, the seed sellers that you might get catalogs from. Mm -hmm. Before you place your order, call them up and say, you know, are, are these organic, open pollinated? heirloom are they uh are they gmo are they treated mm -hmm. with any kind of chemicals that i should know about uh these are just good questions for us to get curious about and then kind of make our decisions the more we know what are we comfortable with what 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 is okay with us um it's and i really think really helpful some of those yeah. decisions are going to be personal um but i also think that if you say to yourself you know those non-organic corn chips or corn oils that I'm getting at the store, like, is that really worth it to me? Mm -hmm. um, and would I rather, you know, either not buy them and just not get those or pay the extra 30 cents to get the, the organic kind? And I know to some extent, these are, you know, questions of like privilege and capacity. Like some people are just too busy with their with their lives with surviving with feeding their kids and keeping the lights on i get that but i also know that there are people who have the capacity to pay attention to this and they will if they know enough that they yes. should they should be and and i'm one of those people and so i find it my responsibility mm -hmm. to keep showing up and doing that mm -hmm. if i can it's a huge responsibility and and i would thank you for doing it because honestly i has raised it in my level. I do, you know, everything I can to even, even I have no money. I still try to buy organic. It's, it's a personal decision for your own health as well as a vote for yes. a healthier planet. Yes. As is the guest I had actually came on my podcast that came out today. She owns an organic farm in, in West Ireland. Huh. Um, this is all she's working for is trying to keep, you know, uh, She's trying to do the same thing you're doing to protect the seeds, to protect farmers, to protect. Yeah. And she says one of the most radical um, acts you can take in support of this is to go to your farmer's market on Saturday morning and ask them. And, and the organic ones, because there are some that are and some right. that aren't. And just hand them your money. It's just so tangible and so yes. reinforcing to both of you and yes. to the yes and to protecting. And those ones that aren't, you know, uh, the organic label and certification is its own challenge and it has its own compromises yes, yes, and yes. issues. So simply talk to the farmers and say, how are you growing this? Like, mm -hmm. I see you're not certified organic. Are you all natural? Are you, you mm -hmm. know, and you just haven't been able to get the certification? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Good questions. To because, you know, again, like there is greenwashing at all of these levels. Sure. And so it's up to us to ask these questions. Yeah. We have to be diligent. We can't be lazy. And and yep. we've been lazy for so long. We just said, right. okay, I'll buy, I'll eat, I'll do anything. Right. And then I'll, all of a sudden when you stop, it's just, a, it's a pretty simple decision to just say, wait, let's not do it the yeah. automatic way. Let's be intentional about what we're eating, buying, yeah. planting, discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we can't, I mean, we all know there are so many converging crises uh, we can't oh. be diligent about everything right. all the time, but we can add a little bit of diligence just about everywhere. And that counts for something. Well, and this is so related. You know, if, if you're concerned about climate change, biodiversity loss, just the future of the planet, it's just important to incorporate some of these thoughts into your thinking yeah. and into your voting. And, and a lot of the items that you were talking about earlier, I was, um, I was interested when you talked about, um, Svalbard and this, uh, and I don't know if this was, I can't remember now if this was in your book or on your, 
and an interviewer heard you talking about because I also recently interviewed someone from Svalbard. These things kind of start going together, uh, recurring themes. I was not aware that there is this, I think you called it the mother of all seed banks in Svalbard, which is for people who don't know an area, it, it's the it's the most further north uh, populated area of the world. It's in the Arctic yeah. Circle. And um, it's about and, 1500 miles north of the Arctic Circle, uh, an archipelago. Or, and that is where this, uh, the Doomsday Vault, as people refer to it, <laughs> Uh, the the largest seed bank in the world is held. Yeah, I I was surprised that that is such common knowledge because it's so and there's pictures of it and there's a website about it and um, I mean I had two thoughts because we one of the reasons they built it there is because it's a stable and cool cool climate but as we now know I think that was in 2008 and now that this, you know the woman I spoke to who lives there I mean they just see the ice melting all the time so it's it's a changing climate but compared to the rest of the planet and perhaps it's the the most stable but but isn't that a dangerous proposition to have all the world's seeds backed up in one spot and then have everyone know exactly where it is I mean Norway's <laughs> well, not exactly the toughest country in the world that they're I, I applaud them for doing this but you right. know well, in fact, uh, to be clear, uh, the the seed vault at Svalbard is a collaboration between uh, the Norwegian government and a large international uh, nonprofit called the Crop Trust. So this is a collaboration okay. of all major seed banks in the world. I see. And this one location. So Svalbard is not um, is not the only seed vault holding these seeds. It is the backup copy of the backup copies. So okay. <laughs> when you think about seed, right, there is, there's two kinds of conservation. One is in situ, that is in the places where, where these seeds live on the plants in the ecosystem. So okay. I'm looking, you know, at my tree outside, it is its own seed bank. It replenishes its seed every year. People have started preservation ex situ seed banks off site uh, okay. in order to make sure that we have all of this biodiversity saved somewhere in the event. And it started as governments oh. looking to make sure they had all of their agricultural genetics mm -hmm. saved so that if something happened, war, large climate catastrophe, whatever it mm -hmm. might be, they could still feed their people. Right. Hmm. So it started that way in the 1800s. Over time, we now have something like 1700 large seed banks across the world who are oh. saving the seed diversity of their places or of their exact um, a, a, a specific genre of seed, if you will. So it could be all the dry land crops in the Middle East, or it could be all the beans in uh, South America. Hmm. So well, all the potatoes in Peru. So all of these seed banks recognized that because of climate change and political, geopolitical uh, instability, it was a good idea to have a ba another level I of see. security. And oh. they came together and developed Svalbard and the, the seed bank at Svalbard. Um, and the, mm. the crop trust and the Norwegian government oversee it. And yes, it has had some permafrost uh, melting. None of the seed vaults, the, the um, none of the seed vaults themselves have been um, affected by that melting uh, and have all remained stable. And all of the seed there is under multiple levels of security in terms of only the organization that deposits the seed in the seed bank can ask for that exact seed to be withdrawn. Okay. And, uh, and not even the administrators at Svalbard can open the accessions. They are that well protected. Like a Swiss bank. Exa well, <laughs> When we all thought Swiss banks were good, yes, but, oh, that's, that's uh, right. A good point. I think they've I'm had going some with an old uh, right, thing. right. I think they've had some PR issues yes, recently. That's um, one way to put it, yeah. But uh, and and they do not allow uh, any GMO seed. 
uh, well, in, that, in yes. the seed bank, which was the Critically decision important. of the Norwegian government specifically. Oh, so they made that decision. They made that decision. Yeah. Well, I'm sure so, they backed up somewhere else. Yeah, I'm, right. yeah, I'm pretty sure Bear Monsanto's <laughs> protecting a, a, and the others. Yes. So. Wow. I, yeah, I was also uh, entertained by your, well, not entertained. Actually, that's a, completely the wrong word. Um, you ordered some seeds from a, a Palestinian um, woman, I think, uh, that you were so excited because they were so pure. And I, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and uh, I wrote a book about Palestinians, actually. So I, I, I spoke with a lot of Palestinian farmers and uh and this is one of their, you know, the, I mean, and now we're in a crisis that, that that we won't even begin to or want to touch at this moment. But um, you see why people protect their seeds at all costs. They leave, they move, and they, 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 they you, you talked about, you know, women sewing them in their hair, Native American women and African women, and, and I'm sure Palestinian women have done that as well. But I, I found it so uh, tragic and sad for you that when you were so excited to receive these wheat, these pure wheat seeds that you could plant, that they had been opened and confiscated, which yeah. is something that is sort of par for the course, has been my experience in that neck yes. of the woods. Yes. Um, yes, that uh, <laughs> Vivian Sansor is the founder of the uh, Palestine Heirloom Seed Library. And uh, it, it is not a physical space, but it is her work to try and find oh. and share and propagate as many heirloom varieties of all the the food seed plants of her place as she possibly can. Because, you know, mm. and again, this speaks to biodiversity loss as, as we have allowed uh, governments or corporations to tell us what we should eat and and what will be available to us to eat. So we can get bananas all year round across the globe, but mm -hmm. they have been reduced to one variety. And there's sort of a banana crisis because of this. Um, and, you know, what was hundreds of species of wheat that were uh, grown and cared for and culturally significant to the people of the Middle East, you know, is now narrowed down to five varieties that sell well, grow well, yeah. ship well, store well. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Vivian Sansor was very passionate and dedicated and fierce and still is at the importance that these foods are a cultural identifier for the Palestinian mm -hmm. people and to lose them is another form of genocide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and this is true for, you know, the, the Jewish diaspora as well right. and right. the African and the Asian that we as people have foods that are part of our cultural integrity and heritage and identity. And that's important. And so you know, and, and so many of these people speak of these seeds and these plants <clears throat> that have fed their people throughout time as oh, ancestors yes. or as, as, you know, relations. And mm -hmm. the difference between the way they care for seed, land-based peoples who see seed this way, mm -hmm. and the Bear Monsanto idea of them as commodities that you can genetically modify and soak in chemicals in order to get the most profit possible. Like these are the two contrasting worldviews that I, I think, you know, a lot of my book is trying to grapple with. Yeah. How do we navigate it away from one and more, more beautifully and healthfully towards the other? And that is what you're doing. I mean, that is what your <laughs> book is doing. That's your contribution. And, um, and and that is your gift. And uh, the more that we raise awareness, the more that we tell these stories, the personal stories, the mm. the cultural stories, you know, the more likely we are to do our our part to, to hold on to the the true value of of these seeds, of these plants, of our biodiversity, of our future. So, um, yeah. I just want to thank you, really, with all my heart, for what you're doing. It's so important. It's so it matters so much and oh, thank it, you. it, you've devoted your life to it in such a powerful way. And, and that's what it takes sometimes is a lifetime. You, you started as a child, you're still doing it, you're doing it more robustly than you've ever done it. And 
and that that's um I'm glad we're able to preserve that on, mm. on on video and on radio and on books so that other people can can learn from it so mm, Jennifer, thank, thank you. you very very much i will put the links to all your books and your radio program your podcast in the show notes and i encourage everyone to to check it out whether you had any interest in gardening or not it does matter to you so thank you thank you very much i appreciate it it's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you thank you same same with you it's been an absolute pleasure take care